liberation and freedom, it sounds so heavy, so daunting, so serious. A couple of years ago, I was tapped to be the musical director for the Happy Hearts Fund, um, a charity that I sat on the advisory board for. And they were, honor they were honoring Quincy Jones with a Lifetime Achievement Award. And they asked me to be the musical director. And I thought, wow, that's, that's really intense to be the musical director for a Quincy Jones thing. So for a couple of weeks, maybe a little bit longer before the show leading up to it, I took the band into the rehearsal room and we worked out what we were going to do in order to honor somebody that I feel is one of the greatest living composers um, today. And the day of the show comes, we do these songs, we do the performances, I see Quincy Jones in the audience, I'm too nervous to make eye contact with him. I'm not typically a nervous person, but this is, after all, Quincy Jones. I end the set by singing Fly Me to the Moon. What does Quincy Jones have to do with Frank Sinatra's Fly Me to the Moon? Well, if you don't remember, it was during that time, the civil rights era where, uh, or actually preceding, going up to the civil rights era where Frank Sinatra tapped Quincy Jones to be his band leader in order to conduct and arrange uh, a version of Fly Me to the Moon, to which his record company was absolutely aghast. Him? He's a black guy. And Frank said, and I don't care what he is, he, he's the man, he gets it, and he's going, to, he's going to be the one who's going to arrange it. And if you see this black and white footage on YouTube of Frank singing this song and Quincy behind him, there's the part where Frank turns to Quincy and he says, jump, Q, jump, you know, and, and Q's just directing the thing and he's got the smile on his face, it was absolutely revolutionary. So I'm singing this song and I'm absolutely mortified because I'm like, I'm singing Frank Sinatra's song that Quincy Jones arranged in front of Quincy Jones as he's getting ready to receive a Lifetime Achievement Award. Thank you, good night. And I go to rush off the stage before you know somebody throws a head of cabbage at me. And, uh, and my, my bassist turns to me and says, Jay, turn around, you have to see this. And I turned around and I said, what? And he said, he was the first one on his feet and Quincy Jones gave me a standing ovation. And I was like, oh man, that's, that's intense. You know, everyone else, uh, stood up as well, you know, because Quincy stands up, of course, everyone has to stand up. So he summons me to his table afterwards, and, uh, and I go up and I say, yes, sir, and he says, I want you to join my coalition. He says, these young people today, they don't know anything about real music, and you know about it, and I want you to help me translate that to the younger generation. And um, I said, yes, Mr. Jones. He says, don't call me Mr. Jones, call me Q. I said, yes, Mr. Q. <laughs> But, it, but it, it got me to thinking, you know, about this disconnect between my generation, perhaps Mr. Q's generation, and then the generation that will uh, succeed me. And what we have in common and what we, what we don't have in common. And I remember being a little kid and, and thinking about my mother's music versus my music, something I could call my own. And I'm like, well, mom, you know, you don't get it. We have a new sound. So every day that I kind of wake up in my apartment in Tribeca and I'm looking at stuff with what the kids are into, I kind of sit there and I scratch my head and I said, man, I, I don't get it. Like I've become that generation that maybe just doesn't get it. I had the opportunity of going to Russia a couple of years ago with an old classmate of mine from Exeter or at the behest of an old classmate of mine from, uh, from boarding school. And we went, or we embarked on this two and a half month tour of Russia. The mission was not for me to go over kind of with the old school model of just performing my songs and doing what I do, get into a town and get out. I wanted to build bridges with Russian artists. I wanted to see what was happening on the ground in Russia. A collaborative process, if you will. A hypothesis that, that music transcends language and ostensible cultural boundaries. Um, and it, I think it worked. It turned into a film called The Russian Winter, which premiered at last year's Tribeca Film Festival. And it chronicled that. And if you don't mind, I'll, I'll sing you a little song that came from that. We boarded the train and fled into winter when most other souls found spring. 
We ran into men who told us of when revolution was a song they sing. And although I wanted to stand here and promise you that nothing we do is from fear, the truth is I've fallen hard, answered this calling card, and the price to be paid is unclear. The Tsar and the Princess, the King and the Empress decided to meet over tea. They laughed and they roared because we ignored the greatness we were destined to be. And although I wanted to stand here and promise you that nothing we do is from fear, the truth is I've fallen hard, answered this calling card. And the price to be paid is unclear. We're standing our ground and staring them down. We were never prepared to run. So much is coming gone and some paintings were drawn to remind us of where we are from. And although I wanted to stand here and promise you that nothing we do is from fear. The truth is I've fallen hard, answered this calling card, and the price to be paid is unclear. I didn't just do that, did I? I did. All right, it's cool. So this whole notion of, although I wanted to stand here and promise you that nothing we do is from fear, the truth is I've fallen hard and to this calling card and the price to be paid is unclear. These fear-based actions. So I'm talking about fear-based actions and then I'm thinking about the disconnect between this intergenerational uh, apparent disconnect uh, as it relates to music, qualitative content, substance, that uh, I think you know Quincy Jones helped reaffirm. I knew that it existed, but but he he just reaffirmed the, those suspicions. And then I dug a little bit deeper, and I thought about how many of of our children are making their decisions because they are motivated by fear. So you ask a child to read something in class, and perhaps they're not the greatest reader, and their fear of being embarrassed then turns into resentment. And they say, well, you know what? I don't care about reading because reading isn't cool anyway. And they rebel and they lash out at this notion of reading or performing in a standardized sort of way. Well, I don't need to perform up to your standards because I'm an individual and I'm doing what I'm doing. So they are redefining cool based on their fears of inadequacy. I've got everyone done, right? All right, I know I'm speaking at a TEDx event, so you guys are like, okay, make your point, we've heard this before. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know if, if, if there is a point, other than the fact that I'm really disheartened when I turn on the radio, and I don't do it often these days, and I hear music that doesn't challenge me. And I think about my younger relatives, I think about my, my, my friends who, who now have children, and these children who are copying what they see uh, in films or what they hear on the radio. And thank God we live in a society and an environment where an artist can do what he or she wants to do. But instead of just complaining about it, instead of saying, hey man, turn that trash off, irrespective of whether I think art is trash or not, I have to take it a step further personally, I do, than just judging it and condemning it as such. So what I do is I make the alternative. And I never actually thought of myself as an alternative artist until I woke up in the modern paradigm and I said, nobody is playing anything on the radio <laughs> that sounds remotely close to what I'm doing, which by its own definition qualifies me as an alternative artist. Because Every day that I get up, I attempt to make qualitative art rather than quantitative art. And don't get me wrong, I spent many, many years climbing that mountaintop and succeeding by 
um, many people's standards, making quantitative art. I just put out as much as I could, and you know what? The odds say that something is going to hit, that something's going to sell a lot, and it did. But then I found myself on stage, on a world tour, singing music, performing, in something that I didn't believe in. And I wondered, the energy, the energy that I'm putting out into the universe, if it's hurting me by putting it out, what is the price that I have to pay karmically? What am I doing and how am I affecting the others who might be tuning into it? And do I really care? Because if I cared for you all in this audience as the listener, wouldn't I want to give you something that was good for you rather than something that might destroy you or might encourage you to in turn destroy yourself? I know you've seen the breaking of a man. You taking all you can as if the house we made was laid across the sand oh lord penalties for suffering can seem so hard dreaming the days when everything's so dark tried to walk good where does that road start a show i john thought exercise a sought out to advise and add on. I changed the thinking you so proudly had on this mobilizing effort. It picks up from where the best of the best came and left it. The treasure of truth. I mix drinks within a booth that can't be measured with youth. I break leaven with the seven and let whatever produce my past estrange the light. If change is right, well, you can say the judge killed me. And then I came to life, a newborn like a neophyte fruitful love from the tree of life. This is the letter I don't need to write. Peace, see law, bless the stars. If I don't breathe tonight, if I don't save you from yourself, maybe the Lord might. What I envision is better, steady, higher living from this system, though some dudes might be dead already. I graduated from a school where the minds varied to hold a burden, known to those that only time carries. This cherry blossom of martial artist studied the chi, written on gossamer, tutored by philosophers demonstrably. I deconstruct the subpar and put them back together like the monsters be. How you want it? Obvious or subconsciously, if every man has a price, who sponsors me? We should do more than just drink responsibly. You see, even in the mountains, Lord John was free. I know you've seen the breaking of a man. You taking all you can as if the house we made was laid across the sand oh lord penalties for suffering can seem so hard dreaming the days when everything's so dark tried to walk good where does that road start a shell as fate would have it. They would have me talking savage like the average among us and not confined to the youngest. I'm like the magical healer slash masterful builder. I know the riddle of steel is in the hands of the wielder. They tried to shatter my leader, do bad to the breather for living page 27 from the bag of Vegeta's. So when his time stopped where he lay, read I'd rather be hated for what I am than loved for what I'm not. You can't subtract logic. I put tulips on his grave and waxed philosophic to the words he gave. Read my lips, it's a new day coming, and it ain't coming because it's here for the taking. This has been years in the making. I've spent years in a station waiting to make this entrance. I'm here to free the world, young star. What's your intention? This is warfare, youngin. The lightning is flashing now. Tune in and let's see what's happening now. One way or another, it's going down. And I know you've seen the breaking of a man. Yeah. You've taken all you can as if the house we made was laid across the sand. Oh, Lord, penalties for suffering can seem so hard. Dreaming the days when everything's so dark. 
Tried to walk good, where does that road start? Show, show, show. Thank you. So I've been mulling over this notion of redefining the culture of cool. History repeats itself, right? Fashion repeats itself. It goes in trends. So now we're at a point. I'm from I'm from a, a little place in, in in New York called Brownsville, Brooklyn. Now we're at a point where. It's not necessarily cool to embrace academia. When I was coming up, I remember seeing those pictures from the civil rights movement of black men protesting in the streets, marching with, with signs around their necks, saying, I am a man. And then walking with their heads high with a book underneath their arm, which screamed, I am a literate man. And that was cool. And that's what encouraged me. And we didn't have much growing up in Brownsville. I mean, we had a loving home, but we didn't have things. We had concepts. And my mother, God bless her, who's probably going to watch this as soon as it airs. And if you want to ever see a little brown woman blush, you'll see that when I mention her on stage. Hi, Flo. Uh, she would get her hands on any book that she could and, and put them in front of me and would encourage me, this is how you this is how you'll make a difference. So I can't do it alone. And I would implore my peers, let's engage in a little subversion. Let's be a little responsible. Let's recognize that the content that we put out will come back to us. And let's do more good than harm uh, before it's too late before initiatives like the Youth Promise Act have to be implemented in order for us to see change within the juvenile justice system before it goes off of a cliff, before it's too late. I'm being advised to wrap it up. I'm sorry for not preparing this speech more eloquently, more effectively, and more timely, but I thank you for your attention. My name is John Forte, thank you very much.